All right, everybody. Welcome to the first annual Pro Football Spot NFL Draft Hangout. I'm Scott Karasik. I'm here with John Ledyard, Matt LaPan, and Anthony Chiodo. Which, if I messed your name up, <laughs> nope, it you it. <laughs> no, actually, it's a uh, Chido. It's a weird Italian name. Yeah, uh, if I like I said, if I messed it up, too bad. Like, <laughs> I'm, it's the one time I'll say your last name, and then from then on, <laughs> Anthony. Yep. <laughs> um. Anyway, Merry Draftsmas Eve, everybody. Thank, Thank you. You too. <laughs> it's a. Uh, it's been a long time coming. We're all sitting here on about a combined 12 hours for the week. Between the four of us, there's about 12 hours of sleep for the week. Um, Probably. Yeah. i say that's <laughs> accurate. So we're not exactly looking at the most, uh, how do I put this, acute minds at the very moment. This is true. Nope. But... We were in a nice discussion right before the show. We were talking about Bud Dupree, Vic Beasley. We could even throw in Dante Fowler there. Everybody's favorites in this class, the edge rushers. I'm a big fan of Bud Dupree because I, I love the ceiling. I think he's, you know, Sean Merriman back when Merriman was doing roids. I think that <laughs> ceiling, you know, that nice 30 sacks and about, or sorry, 40 sacks and about 30. John Abraham type guy, but you gotta find him with the right role. Yeah, I think that Dupree is a guy that has probably one of the highest ceilings in the draft. I don't think that there's any doubt that he's one of the most athletically gifted players in the draft. Um, if you follow me, you know I'm lower on him than most because I have a second round grade on him because I don't see the natural instincts on tape. I don't see the diagnose and recognition ability to be able to make snap plays. Um, too many plays go by him. Um, Scott, you brought up a good point earlier that he was asked to do way too much at Kentucky. There's no doubt he was asked to be in cover. I mean, he was just asked to do way more than a player with where he is in terms of his ability with the rawness that he, that he brings to the table currently should be asked to do. So I think that if he gets into an NFL defense, right away, and his role simplified in the NFL, they say, hey, go get after the passer to start with, and then they build from there, depending on where he ends up. He's a player who could be extremely good, there's no question, because his athletic gifts are absolutely off the charts. He just doesn't really have a good sense of what to do with him, and I don't see the natural football instincts that I'd want to see if I'm taking a guy in the first round, but I totally get the attraction to take him in the first round, and there's no doubt in my mind he'll be a top ten pick. And I think the thing that you have to look at there is when you use Vic or when you use a Bud Dupree, the idea is you got to use him like you would use a Vic Beasley. You don't put him in coverage. Right. He's that's solid that's coverage, ridiculous. But you don't put a guy like that in coverage. He's your best pass rusher on the field. So you use him two ways. You just say, hey, you go attack the quarterback, mm -hmm. or hey – you one gap in the run game. Right. That's all he does. And it's the exact same role pre-snap. It's here's this gap, attack this gap every single play. And once he gets that down, teach him stunts. Right. Work with stunts. Once he gets that down, start working two gapping into his repertoire. But you gotta build them up from the ground up. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I think that the ability is clearly there, and they say that he's a film junkie, and then he'll watch tons of tape, and he'll learn his stuff. So if that's the case, if he's willing to put in that work, yeah, then the sky's the limit for the guy, honestly. He just needs a competent coach. Yeah. Yep. Unfortunately, where he's going to be selected, there's a good chance he's not going to get the best coaches, the best yep. supporting cast around him. I think that that's going to kind of waste his talents. He's he's going into a, most likely a situation where you're not going to have very built up defense, and he's going to get asked to do too much again. That's my biggest fear with him. I mean, he's like we've been saying, he's got the the athletic ability, he's got the off field stuff. His coaches loved him, 
but is he going to be asked to do too much? And with that, does his skill set go away? Right. So, Matt, where do you think he's going to be selected that you're saying that? I, From everything that I'm hearing, he sounds like a top 10 guy. I think he might slide a tiny bit. Um, my last mock I did, I had him going actually to New Orleans. Um, I think they're, they're in pretty big need of some pass rush. I just I don't see much support around him if he does go there on that defense in terms of players that are going to make plays around him to allow him to do what you said. Just do one or two things where it's either going to be go straight ahead and attack the passer or one gap in the run game. I think he's going to be asked to do a little more than that, especially if he ends up you know, where I think he might be in New Orleans. See, I, I think he's got three spots that he's gonna he could land. I think he's either gonna go to Jacksonville at three, which that might sound crazy to some, but no, as I think Anthony it's and I, Anthony and I were talking about it before the show, the third pick over the last like four years, oh yeah, has just been a dumb pick. <laughs> it never fails. It except never for, fails, man. Except for that one year, <laughs> dumb pick. Like outside of 2011. The picks just don't make any sense at that spot. Um, because 2012, it was. Is that Tyson Jackson? He was third, wasn't he? No, it was the trade up for Trent Richardson from one spot. Oh gosh. <laughs> In 2013 was the trade up for Deion Jordan. Yeah, that's yeah. working out. Yeah. <laughs> and then 2014 was the Blake Bortles. Surprise. Yeah. Which, if you think about it, it does make sense from the standpoint of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Who's the best guy that's going to help our team? Who's going to destroy our analytic athleticism process? Mm-hmm. And, you know, who fits a need? Right. So, scheme, athleticism, need. And, you know, that's Blake Bortles to a T. He's a scheme, he's an athlete, he's a need fit. He just, it works. And I think that's why Bud Dupree at Jacksonville doesn't sound that crazy when you look at it that way. Yeah. Like, that's, if they use him in a, like, as the Leo there, that's probably, like, the, one of the best places to, like, use his skill set. Like, in that role. I completely agree with you. I think him as a Leo in Jacksonville would be perfect. Him as a Leo in Atlanta would be a similar situation, although I think Atlanta's interior has a little bit more gel to it than Jacksonville, but both interiors yeah. would be very good for him. Um, mm-hmm. And then I think the Jets, as the other fit, uh-huh. he'd have yep. the big fat bodies in front of him to eat the blockers and give them open lanes, and then you use him where you have Copels right now. Yeah. Yeah, and he has tall bowls there to, like, actually, like, coach. Right. And even if he is the head coach, like, they know something of that, like, if he goes to Washington, like, he's not going to get coached. Exactly, and I can see Bowles loving him the strong side linebacker spot, too, mm-hmm. which Bowles doesn't use him, use their strong side linebacker in coverage often. He just crashes him in, crashes him in. He's more of a caper style with how he uses his outside linebacker. They crash, they play the run, they drop into coverage about 100 times each, and that's it. And 100 times out of 800 something snap, is not a lot. Right. Mm-hmm. I think that he's pretty interesting in that defense as well because of how dynamic that front seven can be. Adding another piece like that, and like you said, where he only drops into coverage one out of every 8 to 10 plays, I think that that will maximize opportunities. I. I Going back to the the possibility of him landing in Jacksonville, I think that Jacksonville is kind of almost an ideal landing spot for him. I almost like him there better than what a lot of people think they might do in Fowler. I just think that he has a chance to really change the attitude of that defense. He brings that bit of an edge, and he brings that hustle, and I think that's something they really need along that defensive front seven. they've They've been lacking. They've been trying to find that guy. And I think he could be it. I think it would make sense to, to see him go three. I have him going to the Redskins, actually, in my mock. So um, do I. I. I think that there's a decent possibility that Washington tries to trade down. Um, but there's the same thing with, I mean, you could say it for a number of teams. I 
I think Oakland could trade down. Um, I think Tennessee obviously is trying to trade down, but what they're asking for is ridiculous. But um, I think that Dup- I could see Washington falling in love with Dupree and not having any idea really how to use him best because that's what Washington does with players. <laughs> that would probably be one of his worst fits, I think. If he, if he were to go somewhere, that would be one of those fits where you all if, – if you like Dupree – you suddenly like hold your breath when if he goes to Washington because you're like, oh, I'm not sure they're going to know what to do with him or how to use him most effectively or bring him along at the best rate. So, so, so like when uh, Miami took Deion Jordan, and I was like, oh, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> we all see how that turned out. So. Right. Yeah, and Jordan's not helped things, obviously. But. Well, it was the worst place for a guy like him on and off the field. Yep. Because Miami's weed culture is – it's right up there with Colorado. It's yeah. Really <laughs> out there because of all the old fogies that vote conservatively. Uh, it is the truth. I hate to say it that way, but it's the truth. And then Miami on top of that just has stupid coaches. Mm. That's what I, I was just about to chime in with that. Their coaching staff. No. Every every time you look at it, they just they don't have control over that team. They're awful. The, the, the inmates are running the asylum a lot of the time there. And then... On top of that, this year you look at it and they bring in a guy that's extremely volatile toward you know on and off the field in the Dom can sue. It's it's almost a it's never a blessing for a player to be suspended like Jordan, but man, I I have a feeling that locker room is going to be real bad again. Where where's the off field issue with Sue? Because I not, not necessarily off field. I oops, sorry about that. I cut you off there. Sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just saying, I've heard he's a teddy bear. I've heard he's a teddy bear in the, in the media. I've heard he's a, a tough guy to get along with in the locker room. I, I've heard he's he's a great person, but he's very – it's the same thing as with on the field. And, you know, he's a very fiery guy. He's, he toes that line a little bit. And I, I've heard that some, some teammates have a little bit of a tough time getting along with him. And when you're in a locker room like that that's had problems before, I, I just worry about – him being in a locker room like that where there's not a real good leadership core that's going to kind of bring him down if he gets that way. That's a that's a fair complaint. I could see that. The only thing that I'm not as worried about is he doesn't have to be the leader there. They're not going to ask him to be the leader there because they've got Cameron Wake. Mm. You know, because they've got Brent Grimes. Those are more the real leaders in that locker room. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think Miami has so much. And the most frustrating thing about Miami is that I think that were they coached by someone else, we would have seen them in the playoffs last year. They almost made it anyway. Um, And we would see them in the playoffs again this year. I just think that there's a ton of talent on that team. Um, And that offense is just bottled up, super conservative. um, And, yeah, defensively, it's tough to know what they're doing with all the talent because there's so many good pieces. Such a talented team, but they just don't seem to achieve anything new. Yeah, with the talent, they could have a top ten defense and offense. But Joe Philbin's the head coach, and that's the. He was my biggest concern. I picked the Dolphins to make the playoffs last year, and Philbin being there is my biggest concern, probably towards that pick. I just have this feeling that Philbin's not going to be there much longer. I don't think he's making it through halfway through the year. They struggle. I think it'll get canned before the season's even at the halfway point if they're sucking. I really don't think they're that high on them. Yeah. I was surprised. They, I was surprised they even brought him back. Uh, yeah, I was too. Yeah, I thought he'd be gone this off season. I think he's got one more off season, and then you're gonna see a guy um, that probably should have gotten a job this past year. Get one, and I think Josh McDaniels goes there. And as long as they say, you know what, hey, Tannenbaum and um, I forget who the GM there is, but Tannenbaum and um, Hickey, they control the draft. Your job is to coach the team. They'll give you a giant pool of talent. And then at the end of training camp, you tell them who you want. And then out of that, you're done. That's your talent evaluation. That's all you get to do. He's not going to go for that. He's just not. 
he he's up here. Uh, you know, I'm in I'm in McDaniel's territory right now, and the the thing is, he's he's not quite the the rough personality, but he wants to be in the mold of Bill Belichick, where he controls everything. And that was his biggest problem when he was out in Denver, is he, he wasn't accomplished and wanted to do that. But I don't think he's leaving unless he gets full control. And that's, you know, he's had some opportunities to leave, but wasn't guaranteed full control, and he decided to stay. And the thought around, the thought around this area with McDaniels is he's kind of the prodigal son. He came back, and he's, you know, kind of the heir apparent if he's willing to wait. And I think that's fair. I just I'm not a. You don't give that to McDaniel's. No, I, don't, yeah, I agree. I, oh, I yeah, agree. I, I, I didn't him. say I didn't say I like it. I said it's a, the common thought around here is that he's going to be that guy. I think it's a huge okay. mistake. I think that you know he he does a a decent job evaluating talent and bringing up some of the guys around him, but he just he he gets a little. He gets to be a little bit too cocky almost, and he thinks he is that next great thing. And I, that's what I would worry about if I was handing him the keys to my franchise. You know who I think would be a great fit for Miami is Rick Dennison. The longtime quarterback coach, offensive line coach, offensive coordinator that was all, that's always been with Kubiak. Well, I am. Because I think that fits their team talent very well. I think if you put Brandon Albert, that line of Brandon Albert, Dallas Thomas, Mike Pouncey, Billy Turner, Juwan James, you put that in a zone scheme, and they're already decent block, pass blockers. You put it in the zone scheme, you put it with the three-step drops, you've got a big-ass tight end in Jordan Cameron who would fit. Yeah. You've got Kenny Stills who could be the slot guy. You got Greg Jennings, Jarvis Landry. They're probably going to go with a wide receiver in the first round or the second round at some point that can help stretch the field with Stills. Um, I just I, I see too much talent there to where you could go. You know what? Lamar Miller in his own scheme would be scary good. He would be. Yeah, that, that offense has so much talent. And, and I think Benison would just know. Hey, let's design this offense around what we've got. And running the stretch play with these guys would be fun because they would knock people's heads off as they were opening the holes properly. It would look like that old Denver Broncos offense. And I just think Dennis deserves a shot because he's been, you know, Kubiak's lackey for the past 20 years. <laughs> and, you know, he's been an offensive assistant. He's been a special teams coach. He's been a line coach, a quarterback coach, an offensive coordinator. After a certain point, you know, and he played defense when he played in the NFL for about nine years. So, I mean, after a certain point, you're just like, this guy deserves to do something other than be someone's assistant. Right. Yeah, can definitely see it. I mean, yeah. my, Miami's one of those teams that has been trying to find their identity for years now, really. I mean, in some ways, ever since Marino left, and I, I don't know whether they would look to someone like that to be their head coach um, as a team with so much young talent. But at the same time, that doesn't – we've seen that just because Miami doesn't want to do it doesn't mean it wouldn't be the best move. Um, and I think that somebody like that would be a very interesting fit with all that talent. And you're right, it could be, it could be the perfect solution, the perfect thing to bring it, bring it all together. But I think if Philbin doesn't get off to a good start, something's got to change. We're digressing away from the draft, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're talking about things that... That's the, what's so great about the NFL draft, and people don't realize it, is everything in the NFL of the draft. Mm -hmm. You can't go through a season without it affecting the draft because injuries, right. draft order, contracts, free agency, everything affects the draft. Who the coaching staff is, who the position coach is, affects the draft. Because some position coaches just have that prickly personality like Brian Cox does in Atlanta. Like Pepper Johnson does. I, I don't know where Pepper Johnson's at, but... Um, Buffalo. Yep, Pepper's up in Buffalo. 
He's the Jets. Well, I was going to say, did he? I, I th- oh, did he move? moved because uh, once Rex came in, he kind of cleaned house up there. Yeah, because Pepper and Rex didn't get along. Yeah. Pepper's but, making his rounds around the AFC East. Pepper's, well, I think Pepper and Todd Bowles are going to have a very fun partnership. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Pepper Pepper Johnson's one of my favorite, favorite uh, assistant coaches in the NFL. He, he did so many things up here in New England, and he just did it so well, and he, he's got that fiery personality, like you said, that prickly personality, but the players rally around him. You know, you used to see some things here in New England where generally you'd see a player get the team fired up. That wasn't the case. Pepper Johnson would be on the field. He'd be out there, and he'd be in the middle of the, the team huddle, and he'd be running things. And I think with that Jets defense, some of those defensive linemen are going to rally around him. That That's scary. If you can get those guys even more motivated than they are, that's a scary group. Mm-hmm. That's already a scary group. Mo Wilkerson, yeah. Damian Harrison. I'm sorry, Damian Harrison, Sheldon Richardson. That's a nasty group. And then they got my boy T.J. Barnes out of Georgia Tech, a Lumen 90. <laughs> Add another edge rusher in this year's draft, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Add an edge rusher. Yeah. All oh, those defensive I, uh, backs they got. Here's, here's an interesting uh, storyline that might uh, might take effect here, guys. With tomorrow's draft starting up, and you hear some reports coming out in New York that Wilkerson is unhappy, he might be on the block. Do you think there could be a situation where he gets traded on draft night and they get they get a pick? You know what could be the uh, you know what could be the real situation? Mo Wilkerson and six traded up to two. That's kind of exactly what I was going with there. I think that Wilkerson Wilkerson that six pick could get them up to two. They could get, you know, a, a legitimate quarterback because that's that's the biggest thing. Yeah. The biggest thing that's holding them back is is their quarterback situation. It's, it's that way across the AFC East, if you ask me, and across the NFL. A lot of these teams that are in bad situations, you need the quarterback. And I'm not sure if they're necessarily getting the guy, but they're getting a guy that's better than what they have now. Do you think that the Jets are even that, that interested in? Uh, well, if they're if they're that interested in Mariota, do do they think they can stay at six and just get him without having to trade up? I mean, unless Wilkerson really wants to get out, I don't. I just don't. I think the Titans are bluffing, and so I think unless the Jets think someone's going to jump them, which could happen, the Browns and the Eagles have expressed interest. So unless somebody thinks the Jets think somebody's going to jump them to get Mariota, I wonder how inclined they'd be to move up. Yeah, everything everything I'm hearing from uh, you know just a couple of the N- the NFL writers that I follow out in New York, just from you know going up against the Jets twice a year is is Wilkerson's not happy, and right. he wants he wants some more money, and I don't think they're necessarily willing to give him what he wants, and he he seems unhappy. I'm not positive, but I believe he missed some of the voluntary workouts, skipped those voluntary workouts, and. You know, the reports are that he's on the block from a couple of reputable writers, and, you know, the, when that comes out right around the draft, i, I got to yeah. think that it's it's them trying to, to posture to get another first-round pick and try to build that team up even more. I mean, if they get a quarterback, like, with a talent on that defense and having Brandon Marshall there, like, they could, they could like, be a playoff team if they have a quarterback. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you wonder. I mean, I I like Mariota. I yeah. It would, it's all about what you do with him when he first That's gets true. there. I think. Um, you know, how quickly is he going to be able to ready to step into that role? Is he going to be a guy that's going to have to sit and wait? Um, you know, you've kind of shored up some options there, quarterback in, in the in free agency. So, how much of a prerogative is it for you to go get Mariota? I mean, from everything it seems like that's out there right now, the Jets aren't even that crazy about Mariota. Um, and so I wonder how, but but what you're saying, Matt, is true. If if Wilkerson wants out, you better try and get something for him and get something good for him. And you don't see a lot of player for player for swaps, so maybe your best bet is trying to get something in the draft. And you know why not try and move up? Um, you know if you're going to trade him, uh, why not try and move up? But I think it would have to be a situation where they felt pretty strongly that like someone was trying to jump them, and they fell in love with Mariota. And I'm just not sure both of those things are true. 
I'm I'm with you there. I I don't think that they have fallen in love with Mariota or I don't think it really fits what their need what their true needs are. Yeah. But when you go through who needs something big, they could end up trading up because you gotta think, you could probably move Copels down. Yeah. If Wilkerson's That's unhappy, right. Wilkerson wants to do the contract. You put Copels on the line in Wilkerson's spot, playing more of like that Calais Campbell role, which I think is gonna would be a much better fit. Mm. And then by doing that, you open up a spot on at weak outside linebacker for that Bud Dupree or Dante Fowler pick. And instantly, the defense is better because Quentin Copel shouldn't be playing weak outside linebacker. <laughs> right. Because he's not an outside linebacker. He's a lineman. Right. And then you right. just have Copel's gain a little yeah. bit of weight, play where Mo Wilk is playing, and I think you got a better team. So you don't think Wilkerson's that big of a loss if you if you if they lose him? Not in both. Gotcha. Uh, because I think Sheldon Richardson's more of an important piece. I agree with that, yeah. Uh-huh. Darnell Dockett was the most important piece of that Arizona defense for the longest time. Right. He played the three technique on the weak side of the defense and just continually ate doubles where he was penetrating through, creating commotion. When you look at the Jets and how they fit, Kalei Campbell isn't, like, he's a great player. Right, right. But no one thinks about Kalei Campbell and goes, well, you know, he's what makes that defense tick. Right, yeah. Because he's right. not. He, right. He's not anything close to what makes that defense tick. Um, so I think you could trade away Mo Wilkerson to a team that would need him more, that could use him more. And I think if you did trade him away, it's because you've fallen in love with an edge rusher that can play that weak outside linebacker role. So I could see a trade up to two, not because they fell in love with Marcus Mariota, right? But because they fell in love with Dante Fowler, right? Yeah. No, I got I got an interesting question, guys. We're saying you know they trade Wilkerson, they they move up. What if they they end up trading Wilkerson? They they keep their six pick. They get a pick later, you you know later in the first round, and they pick up a couple picks later in the draft as well. Maybe pick up another one in, in a future year. Who are some of these other edge guys that you guys are, are falling in love with that would be a good fit in that type of defense? Ooh, that's a tough one. For the Jets, so you're talking about, let's say Bud Dupree's off the board, Fowler's off the board, Beasley's off the board. Is that it? Everybody else is left? Yep. Okay. Starting with the with a first round pick or later in the later in the draft? Call it a call it a first round pick. Okay. I, I think he gotta take Randy in that situation. Yeah. And, and I think he's got some issues off the field. He's got some psychological whatever. And New York may not be the best fit for that. But if you want a guy who will fit that team yeah, you could probably pair him with one of the leaders on that team, like David Harris or um, Calvin Pace, someone like that, who could just be like, "Hey, get your stuff together. These are the guys that are going to help you." Hell, even have him talk to Brandon Marshall. Yeah, Darrell Rivas is yeah. in now. Yeah, I mean, like it, when you look at this roster, you don't go, "Oh man, this is a group full of you know right. psychological winners here." <laughs> I mean, like, you got Cromarty, who's got, like... I was going to say, you mean, you mean Cromarty? <laughs> Cromarty's not the leader of that locker room? <laughs> I'm just saying, like, Cromarty, well, maybe in terms of child support payments. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, Cromarty just... He's got some issues. Yeah. I mean, there's so many different things. And then the Jets are also a team that I think could win the stupidest pick award. If they took Landon Collins sixth overall. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> That's not gonna happen. We I say would... that it's not gonna happen, but people forget. NFL teams do stupid shit every fucking year. 
That's bad true. Say bad. See, I just think, and this is coming from this is coming from a you know a New England fan. I think McCagnin's got to be smarter than that. I, he hasn't proved it yet, obviously, because he hasn't had a chance to. But he's just he's got to be smarter than to. I would to go love to call him six. <laughs> and just for him to be like, oh, I'm a GM. <laughs> <laughs> You look at them, though, and honestly, if let's say Gurley's 100%, you know, obviously it's a gamble. Let's say he's 100% week one. You look at that team, even with Geno Smith, say they add an edge rusher in the second round, I mean, this is a really pretty good football team. Um, at deep edge rusher, you can get one in the second round maybe. Gurley's 100%, you know, that that is as big a if as you think it is, you know, at this point. But I could also see him take TJ Clemens at six. Which, even though that may come off as stupid, it makes sense. Brando Giacomini is Ooh. just okay. <laughs> just okay. You know, so I'm being nice here. Right. James Carr is trash. <laughs> um, just awful football player. Has no business playing in the NFL. Yeah, not at all. Yeah. Cologne's getting old. Brickshaw Ferguson's getting old. Mangle's getting old. Yep. Um, yeah, there's a, lot, there's a big yeah, need yeah. for offensive line there. I think I think if they're looking to get a guy like Clemens, though, you can you can move back and still get him a little bit later in the first. For sure, kind of kind of build up your draft board. Everybody says you can move back, you can move back, you can move back. To move back, someone has to move up. So what about the Browns? You think they could sw- jump up there? You think no. they're really out in love with Mariota? If, yeah, if Mariota's still available, that could like trade back to twelve. I think they're in love with Mariota, but I think that. The Titans are just stringing them along because they're the Browns. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they think they can work them for something. They're like, we're going to work you because you're the dumb one who's going to bring our value up. Right. We do it in college. Chip Kelly will come in and make the trade. Exactly. Well, <laughs> we, do it, we do it in car sales all the time where we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we get someone who's just dumb that walks on the level. We go, that got paid. <laughs> That guy's offering this much for this car. Are you sure you don't want it? Right. Like we're not going below his offer, and they go, yeah. oh, oh. And you get someone who's smart to make a stupid decision. Right. That's what the that's what the Titans are trying to do. Yeah, I mean, if yeah. it's true, they want three firsts for a second round. I mean, good luck, man. There's not many teams that can even give you that. It's like, if there was a team to do it, though, it would be the Browns. Yeah, if uh, they want to be the Browns. I think three three first just at any time, I think. But that's what I was just reading that somebody was saying they wanted three first for for the number two pick and I was, you know, probably think if it's the Browns two this year and one next year and that's just a lot to ask of a team for a quarterback. And I like Mariana a lot. I mean, but a quarterback who's uh you know, definitely has some question marks. Not like he's Andrew Luck or something. To be fair, Andrew Lux are one in a million. Right. Like, very few and far between. Yeah, and I wouldn't trade away three first round picks for much less than that. I mean, well, yeah, if you're getting Andrew Luck, you give up three first round picks. If you're exactly. getting Art, you really yeah. don't. Right. Exactly. Ugh. <laughs> I do think Gregory's a guy. I do think Gregory's a guy that could fit there. I, um, it, it Gregory's another one that's in some ways. I don't know where to put Gregory in my rankings. He was four, then all this you know stuff happened, um, and I just I don't know what to do with him because this psychological stuff now is like too weird for me. And I'm like, well, is this stuff legit? I mean, does he really have actual issues? So I just think he's one of those picks. It's just in the dark. I mean, I just think that there's a lot we're just not going to know about him, and you're just going to have to cross your fingers and hope that you can get him mentally straight straight up when when he gets to the NFL because right now I'm just not sure if he's there, and I'm, I'm not sure if he's going to be or how far away he is. Um, I, I, I watched every interview clip I could find of him online. He seems completely normal, well-spoken. Um 
So it's just hard because that is an important part of the process. It's undervalued. Like, what kind of a person are you? Are you getting a guy who's sold out, who's committed? Can he handle the rigors of playing in a professional sport, of being a high end pick, with the criticisms that come along with that? Um, can he handle that kind of stuff? You know, I mean, those are those are definitely valid questions. They can. We've seen it before with athletes where that kind of stuff weighs on them. I mean, look at Vince Young. Like that kind of stuff weighed on him incredible amounts. Um, there's a lot of times we don't even see it, but it goes in off the field decisions that those guys make, whether it, com whether it comes to drugs or alcohol and things like that. So, yeah, I think NFL teams are just going to have to do their homework. And and us as evaluators, I don't know how much we can do. You know, I mean, I I don't know how much we can know at this point other than to base and evaluate him based on his talent, um, which is clearly substantial and, and and a little bit raw in some ways too. But it's tough for me to say, oh, Gregory's a perfect pick anywhere because there's just so many uncertain uh there's so many variables with him yeah i could i could totally see him being like out of the league within five years but i don't think that's likely but i could also totally see him like putting on 20 pounds and becoming like a 10 15 sacks a year guy in pass rushing being the run defender like he already i broke him i did a breakdown of him um like a month ago, and he's like even though he's two thirty five, like he he's not weak. Right. Like he can oh, he yeah. can win with power. Right. Like once you if you add twenty pounds on him, like he can be like an all around good good pass rusher. Like he yeah. can be. He has a he has a really high ceiling too, but almost like Dupree, like he has a low floor and a high ceiling, but just kind of like in different ways. Right. Uh, yeah. His his hands. You're right. He he does flash the ability to win with power. Speed to power conversion is really good. It's super inconsistent and kind of all over the place. Um, but, yeah, it's it's definitely there. There's so many tools there with him. I mean, the length and everything. But you want him at 22, don't you, Anthony? Oh, I want him so bad at 22. <laughs> like if, if he, uh, he's like the opposite of – like if Jalen – if they pick Jalen Collins or Landon Collins at 22, oh. like I'm, I'm just going to turn off my TV. He's the opposite. Like they pick him at 22 – I'll like get off my TV because I'm so happy. <laughs> I don't. I don't see them taking Landon Collins that high. Yeah, I don't either. Because they took Shark Thompson or Shark Thomas a couple of years ago. Yes, right. he's he's had injuries, but he's so good on special teams. Just give him a chance, please. That's what they, that's what they haven't done. I wish they moved Cortez back to free safety. You got to do something with him. I, I said that. <laughs> I mentioned that at one point earlier. Like in the season last year when Paul Mullo got hurt, I'm like, you might want to try Cortez somewhere because at that point he's sitting on your bench active every game and he clearly can't handle being a cornerback. And you paid him all this money, you're not going to get a trade for him with that contract. you got to try and move him around to somewhere. So I wonder if they do experiment with him at safety at all. I don't think the Steelers are going safety in the first round. I, think, I like Landon Collins, but I don't think they're going to. I think they're going corner, yeah. and I do think they should move Cortez back. I'm with you. Yeah. But I've been telling them, I've been telling Cortez that for the past couple of years. Like, dude, yeah. they need to move you back to safety. Yeah. You're not a corner. You never have been a corner. Right. But when he's a nickel and he's guarding Rob Gronkowski one on one, he's the only guy that stopped Gronkowski in a one on one coverage matchup. Yeah. yeah he I mean, was a, a few years ago. He was good in the nickel, and then he was getting hyped up like. He was gonna have a breakout year two years ago, and then last year it just didn't happen because he's not, he can't play on the outside. No. Well, he's just not a left side corner. Mm. That's really what it is. He shouldn't be handling number one. He's a number two corner, but on a team that doesn't have a number one. Yeah, uh -huh. he's definitely asked to. I mean, yeah, Pittsburgh last year, the cornerback situation was a mess. He's definitely asked to do too much in terms of covering ones. But then he came in on the nickel even last year, and you know. His confidence was shot too, but even in the nickel last year, I mean, or as an used as an extra defensive back, he he was, he was awful. Um, I don't think his career is over, but I'd like to see him try and move to safety. I, I feel like this is at the it's, there's a certain point corners hit where you're either a cornerback or you're a safety, right? Or you're just not on the field, like yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't just keep going in between nickel or inside or outside. Right. Pick your damn spot, play your spot. And I feel like he's at that point where you just – there's no true spot for him. And they're not even entertaining the idea of safety up there. 
So. And they should. They really should. If the Steelers, again, when we talk about stupid coaching staffs, people love to go, oh, well, the Steelers are one of the better coaching staffs. Outside of the Super Bowl, what have they done? Yep, that's what I've been saying. Like since, since like the, since the guys at Cower brought in when he was there, have like been gone, they haven't been good. Like they've been like eight and eight, nine seven, like ten six, every season since like the like those like the core like Aaron Smith mm -hmm. and the Casey Hampton guys like that left. Yeah, I mean, the acquisition, I mean, if you follow me at all, you know, Anthony, you know, because you <laughs> have to deal with him all the time, but I, I hype on Kevin Colbert's failures all the time, and you, there's some things you just can't mess up at this stage in the NFL as a general manager. You can't mess up cornerback year after year. You can't mess up, well, defensive back in general, but especially cornerback. And you can't mess up offensive line, and you can't mess up pass rushers year after year. I've broken down all his drafts. He missed repeatedly on outside linebackers to fit to the 3-4 scheme. He misses repeatedly on offensive linemen, and he misses repeatedly on cornerbacks. You can't survive I, that way. I think the offensive line wasn't a talent issue. I thought that was a coaching issue. It's been, been yeah, it's so been, much better with Munchak last year. Oh yeah, it's been a little bit of both. Uh, They've had a little bit of yeah. It, it, so there's been some some transition there that's made it tougher on some of the offensive line talent. But Mike Adams is bad no matter what you do with him, oh. where you play. He's just bad. Um, He's just soft, and he didn't have he didn't have the mental edge to play in the NFL. And he still doesn't, and, uh, you know. I, and I think that, and that's not just for me. That's from talking with Steelers writers who are close to the team, work with them on a regular basis, and hearing them say that that it's just not there. And the Steelers coaching staff knows it's not there. Um, so that's one of those picks, you know, second round with all the issues he had and how many people were passing him up. You'd like to see them pass up on that, but yeah, some some of them has been some coaching. Some coaching issues for sure for the offensive line, because you saw how much better even a guy like Kelvin Beecham was last year. You know, with a with a better offensive line coach, so it's it's made a huge difference. Munchak's changed a lot. I'm surprised Beecham's as good as he is at left tackle. Yeah, me too. That's yeah. a tough position to play. He was a seventh round pick, and yeah, you do not see that every day for sure. And I don't think he's great, but he works his butt off. He studies his film. He knows what to look for from edge rushers. He knows when they're setting him up, and he plays smart for the most part. And yeah, it helps him a lot. His, his feet are what surprised me. I didn't expect him to be that good. I would love to see them take a true left tackle. Yeah. And let Beecham move back inside the guard. When you say true yeah. left tackle, are you thinking a guy like DJ Humphreys, who's got true left tackle ability and might need to develop? I don't think he's quite as raw as some people do, but but might need to develop a little bit. Or are you thinking like Andres Pete? Well, he needs to develop too, but what, who, who are you kind of thinking there? I for, love Collins. <laughs> for a Munchak scheme, well, Collins would be perfect. But, right. Um, I was thinking more Jake Fisher. Yeah. Fisher's a guy that would, would be interesting, I think, because Fisher's kind of a natural zone-blocking scheme fit. Not to say he couldn't fit in Pittsburgh, but... I don't know that I see it as being like one of those automatic things that oh yeah like Pittsburgh would be all in on him because he's exactly what they need on the offensive line. That I makes think sense. Or he may not be the best run blocker, but as a pass blocker, if you yeah. have Fisher and Beecham sitting there covering that left side, yeah, you got a nice long, nice just open pocket on the left side. You got Ben with some comfort on his left side, to where he doesn't have to worry too much about it. And then Gilbert's not that bad on the right side. Yeah, you could even move. I mean, you could even try Beecham if if Gilbert struggles like he did last year. You know, you could even try Beecham on the right side or put Fisher on the right side for a while. There's a lot of different things they could do. If offensive tackles, the pick for Pittsburgh there, it's going to give their offensive line a chance to be the best in. A long time because last year was already the best they played in. Oh, I don't even remember oh, yeah. it. I want, even before, even better than the Super Bowl team, probably the, the, well, I mean, Super, the last Super Bowl team. The Super Bowl team sucked. Oh yeah, yeah, they were. They had awful offensive lines then. Right. So I don't even. It would. Yeah. It would give their offensive line a chance to be very good, which I would be a fan of. But you gotta have cornerbacks, and they just don't have any. And so I, I'm with you, Scott. I think. 
I think they're going cornerback all the way in the first round. Somebody said the other day they heard Steelers had three of their top five players on their board were corner. Um, somebody's going to be there they like. I think they're going to take them. If I, I'm I'm up Trey Wayne's there to him. Yeah. Just because I thought it made sense. Um, yeah, it does. I mean, I, yeah, that's what they do. I think they Kevin like Johnson. guys who are good football players. They don't seem to care about athleticism. They just go, can this plot? Can this guy play football? Mm, right. But Waynes is one of those guys that they won't realize is an athlete because of how good he is at football. Yeah. Right. I just I, don't think that he's got. I feel like his ceiling and his floor are right there. Like what you see is what you get. He's always going to be the same guy, and he's probably like a fringe top ten NFL cornerback his entire career. <laughs> like that's probably where he's going to be. And if he busts, it's because he gets injured all the time. Well, I'm in the minority on this, but I'd love to see them like take an edge rusher in the first round and then wait till the second and take Stephen Nelson. Because I think Stephen Nelson at his peak is like a slightly less good Brent Grimes. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh I don't think that he's anywhere close to what Grimes is, but I think that he makes sense in Pittsburgh. That's actually the, the second-round pick I have to make in my final lock. But, yeah, the, the Grimes comparison for me, I, um, I'm, I'm one, of the, one of the guys that thinks Grimes is – he's a stud, and I just yeah. don't, I don't see Nelson becoming that guy. I, I don't think he's – He's four cornerbacks better than Brent Grimes in the NFL right now. I don't think he's as good as Brimes. I just like stylistically, I think he's kind of similar. No, nah. he plays like big. He plays big for his size. Like at the catch, like his body positioning is so good that even though he's small, small, he's not that small. He's five it, foot ten. There are a lot of cornerbacks out there in the league that are five foot ten right now. Brent Grimes is five foot seven. <laughs> it's not a good day. He is five foot seven. I've stood next to him, and we are eye to eye. He is five foot seven. He is a tiny <laughs> dude. There's nothing wrong with being a tiny dude, but there are very few guys who are that small that are that damn good. Yeah. He yeah. is the Muggsy Bogues of the cornerback position. He is yeah. that damn good. He's the Maurice Jones-Drew of the cornerback position, and there's like very few guys. One of my favorite players has my least favorite wife in the league, too. That's how ridiculous yeah, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a fan of Miko? I've never been a fan of Miko. Um, I think she's a scourge on what we call... She calls herself a journalist when all she does is sleep with a player every night. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'm going to go any further down that road. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's okay. She's already attacked me personally. Probably six or seven times. <laughs> Sounds like she does a lot of that, though. Oh, yeah. No, you just have to have a high hood rat tolerance for her. There you go. <laughs> uh, but, no, there, there is no Brent Grimes in this year's draft at all. Oh, definitely not talent-wise, no. Absolutely not. Not talent-wise, not stylistically. Like, yeah. It, they're, they're, it just doesn't exist. The closest thing to Brent Grimes came out last year with Ricardo Allen, and even then, like, I still don't think he's anywhere close stylistically. Grimes is just so good. He can man up on anybody. He manned up against Megatron, held him to like five catches for 55 yards because it's friggin' Megatron. Right. And you're giving up like 10 inches. You're giving up, I mean, you're, you're going to give up a bunch, but like five catches for 55 yards on 12 attempts – Four passes were knocked away. One pass was intercepted. You're just like, holy crap, who is this guy? Yeah, just he, because he timed it. Grimes is an animal, there's no doubt. I wouldn't say I wouldn't compare anyone to him, but I think I understand that he's saying a little bit because they're both tough guys and they're both smaller for their position now. I mean, Grimes is on a level of his own, I think, but getting to Steven Nelson, I think that he's a guy who a lot of people, yeah, are, are sleeping on. And not that Steven Nelson is, like, amazing or anything. Uh, I mean, I, I think that he's a very good player. He's very yeah. tough, and I think he's going to put in what it takes to continue to get better technically. But he's a better athlete than people think, 
and he's super tough at catch points. Um, he's super physical with receivers at catch points. I mean, he beat up Jalen Strong pretty yeah, good. Not, I think Jalen Strong. Strong. Yeah, I think Jalen Strong has has some issues with press corners. And Steven Nelson knew that, and he had that mentality. I'm going to take you out of the game from the first snap to the last snap, and he bodied him all game long. Um, and that's the kind of mindset he plays with. So, from the way that I don't think he'll back down one bit from bigger receivers, um, I think that Steven Nelson's a pretty high value pick if somebody takes him in the second round. I like him a lot. See, the guy that I think is underrated at corner is Josh Shaw. Because you pop in his tape, and then everything you see says mid-first-round pick. Really? You realize he's an idiot who fell out of a window. <laughs> I think he jumped out of the window. Sorry, right, he's yeah. an idiot. He out of the window. And then you go, oh. He's an idiot. That's why he's <laughs> But other than that, like, I don't see any reason why he couldn't be a, a first round pick at cornerback or safety. Yeah, I like I mean, I have him rated at safety, but I have a mid second on him. I think he's pretty good. I, uh, I've got him at 40, but I, I think I've got him listed at corner, but he can play either spot. And yeah. he's probably mm-hmm. all in the third round. He'll probably, yeah, he'll probably go. I see him as a bottom of the third. Yeah, depending on how teams view his off the field stuff, it's one of those guys that only takes. Only takes one to love. I wasn't crazy about his tape, to be honest. Um, I don't think he's as instinctive as I like to see defensive back be. Physically, he's, I mean, he's obviously got the speed. I don't know if he always played like it on tape. I guess I wasn't as in love with his tape overall as, as what you're saying, Scott. But physically, he's extremely gifted, and he's, I mean, obviously got the type of size, speed, um, press ability that, the NFL is in love with nowadays for their corners. So from that regard, if you can get him to sharpen his instincts and clean up his technique, I think he could be a very good pick. I just think he moves so well, too. That's what I loved about him is his movement ability and his recovery speed. You know, he's a guy who's going to take a couple chances, but he's able to, to flip his hips, get back, and make a play on the ball. I, I think that, you know, jumping out of a window and then saying that it was to save your nephew who's drowning, you got – that's like as Speaking red as as red as a flag can get. That <laughs> you blatantly just, I mean, you. How do you think of something like that? <laughs> but but his tape makes you makes you think. I I think of him as an early second type of guy, but I think somebody's going to be very happy end of the third round. They're going to take him, and he can within a, probably a year or two step right in and be a starter. My two top safeties right now are him. Well, he's my second, and I have Efo first. And they're both going to go in the third round, like, at the earliest. Yeah, but <laughs> do your board, do you do it based on what you think is going to end up being the best players in the long run? Or do you make it based on where you think these guys are going to be picked? Uh, best players in the long run. Okay, good. Same, yeah. <laughs> do projection boards because projection boards are based on what we see NFL teams link to. That's right. it. That's the only time I do that is for the huddle reports challenge. Other than that, it's always who I think will be the best players from the draft long term. Yeah, and that's why I hated doing the huddle reports challenge because my top 100 getting oh, yeah. some- I was hitting like 64. Yeah. 71. Oh, yeah. I always make a separate one. I make my top 100, and then I make the one for the contest. Um, but, yeah, my top 100 looks not there's, I was Matt and I were help trying to make, figure out our the, the top 100 for the contest, and I kept saying to him, there's this guy. I would never even have him in the top 100 and so on. So, yeah, I, I don't like that. Right? What's that? You put Ali Marpet up there? Yeah, he's in there. Yep. Oh, good. We're just tr- I'm just trying to win. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I'm just trying to yeah. help with the point. Oh, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Ali Marpet's up there. He was like in the – I think I had him at 60-something, 60 or 50-something. I think that's going to end up being one of them. Being one of them? I know, I know he's going to be taken in the first two rounds. Oh, yeah, yeah. You think he'll go to Atlanta? You think the Falcons won him? I think the Falcons are going to take him. They, and I don't know if they take him at 42 or if they trade down to, like, 50. Right. To take him, but just there's two guys that this entire process I've been like, these guys are going to end up as Falcons. 
and Marpet. it's Vic Beasley and Ali Marpet. Yeah, I saw you saying that about Beasley today. Yeah, like I just I get that feeling, and then today it's been like, man, Beasley's the pick. I get the feeling that they're in love with him too. Not you know, even even at like the the Play Sixty event they had today, the Falcons were they they were all about him. You know, tweeting pictures of him and and his interview. I just think he's he's kind of an ideal fit there. And, I can agree with Marpet. I think that he's he's a tough kid. He's gonna work hard. He'll go to that city and he'll he'll be one of the guys that people down in Atlanta love. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because people are gonna look at Ali and they're gonna go, this guy has that Todd McClure attitude. Mm-hmm. This guy is that Harvey Dahl type guy. Yeah, right. You know? they've, been, they've been missing that desperately. They yeah. had, when they had those two guys playing next to each other, they were the arguably the quote unquote the meanest line. They were the nastiest line. They they would beat you up in the well, first couple of quarters. That's why I think yeah. people are underrating Atlanta's offensive line right now because Ryan Schrader, the second half of the season, played yeah. out of his mind. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Played, and just he's a nasty dude. Yeah. John Osamoa is a nasty dude, and everybody knows he's good. Right. Joe Hawley is a nasty dude, and when he's healthy, he can be a top ten center. And then Jake Matthews was a number six overall pick because he's friggin' Bruce Matthews' son and has it in his blood to play football. Yeah. You put Ali Marpet in between Matthews and Hawley and say, enjoy, go have fun, go bust some people's heads up. Yeah. And I think that offensive line goes from people going, oh, man, they're a horrible offensive line. No one should be behind that offensive line just because they don't know any of these names that I just said to, damn, when did Atlanta get good on offense? Holy crap, they're scoring 32 points a game. That offensive line is probably why they're doing all of it. Oh, look at that run game that's magically turned good, even though it's Devontae Freeman and you know a fifth-round pick behind the line. It's, it's like the Steelers' offensive line almost. Like Marcus Gilbert, Kevin Beecham, Ramon Foster, even David DeCastro to a small extent. No, man. Everybody knows like, David. David DeCastro okay. is y'all's Jake yeah. Matthews. Yeah, he is I mean, y'all's, like, everybody was like, dude, David DeCastro is a friggin' top 10 pick. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, then he got injured. And that's that, why I said to a small matter. thing. So, I mean, he's still good, but I guess people kind of forget about him a little bit because he's injured. No, they forget about him because he's a guard. Yeah. That, that too. It's just the position. Like, no one – I hate to break it to anybody who's a huge football fan, but casual football fans don't give a shit who your offensive line is. <laughs> That's true. They're just not sexy to them. They care about who's going to hit the quarterback, who's going to catch the passes, who's going to run the ball, and who throws the passes. That's why fantasy football is such a big deal is people love – Defense, who's hitting the ball carrier? They love offense. Who's scoring the points? They don't give a crap about the fat guys up front. But guys like us, I'm more focused on that in the game than what the route combinations are. Uh, I have to go yeah. back and watch games a second time to be like, man, did they actually run these route combinations that I'm forget that I'm not paying attention to? Mm-hmm. Yeah. As a, as a fat guy myself, I appreciate you saying that as well. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my my friend Pete Smith out of uh, Football Savages he keeps saying fat guys win championships skinny guys sell tickets that's true uh, so I, and I think that's probably the best way to put the, the entire NFL is Fat guys win titles, and you've got to have the right fat guys up front. The fat guys are going to be what separate the good teams from the bad teams. That and coaching. Yeah. Atlanta's one of those teams that really isn't in nearly as bad a spot as many people think they were because, you know, they have struggled last two years. But I, I think they're actually in a pretty good spot because, I don't know your your thoughts on Matt Ryan, but I think he's – He's a very good quarterback, and they've got the talent around him, and they're not that far away, and they haven't drafted horribly all over the place. So um, you get a couple pieces. I mean, you got your left tackle, hopefully. 
You got your cornerback. Um, you got to get a pass rusher. You got to get pass rushers now. If you can do that, they're not far away. I think Matt Ryan's a top ten quarterback. So yeah, I, like I agree too. And I, and I don't think it's crazy to say that he's a top ten quarterback. No, so uh-huh. not at all. I, I don't see ten quarterbacks that are better. Yeah, and I agree. It's like. I've had somebody try and argue with me that Andy Dalton was better. I'm like, Andy oh. Dalton is the replacement level quarterback. Oh. You look up replacement <laughs> level quarterback in the dictionary, you got a picture of Andy Dalton sitting next there, neck right there with Mark Bolger, Matt Hasselbeck, like yeah. Mark Brunel. Like, I don't know if these uh, names are sounding familiar to anybody. Oh, yeah. No, he's right. Well, if anything, he might be worse than those guys. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think he's right on par. Really? I'm he puts up big stats. He looks good every now and again. And then people go, oh, maybe it's... Oh. Yeah, that's Man. what's funny. He'll put off like a big stats game, and next week he comes out like 5 for 20, like 5 interceptions. And we're just like, oh, God, he's so bad. And then they forget again. Yeah, like he'll go he'll go five for twenty with five interceptions and then he'll go like the next game, twenty five for thirty, three hundred and thirty yards, four yeah. touchdowns, and then people forget to realize that like every pass was thrown to AJ Green. <laughs> and like Gio Bernard on like screens out of the backfield or short slants or he's a quarterback you can win with, but he's not a quarterback that's going to win. Yeah. Not gonna, not gonna earn you the tough wins. Exactly. Um, the only other quarterbacks, I mean, people, people like saying Eli Manning and putting him in the top ten. You can win two Super Bowls and not be a top ten quarterback. Yeah, that's true. And Eli's he, an example. <laughs> yeah, the great example, Eli. Manning is a perfect example. Um, trying to think of who else is another like replacement level quarterback. Ryan Hoyer, Ryan Fitzpatrick, like Zach the, Met- the Houston, Houston Texans uh, quarterback staff. <laughs> All of them. That job. Well, no, I'm sorry, Tom, Savage. Tom Savage shouldn't be in the NFL. No, he's if not he was so tall and white, he wouldn't be a quarterback in the NFL. I watched him at Pitt for a while. Every once in a while he makes a throw with a whole strong arm, and you're like, okay, but he's not an NFL quarterback. My favorite tweet of the past year was when somebody was like, uh, Pitt really could have used a quarterback like Tom Savage. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true, though, because, I mean, if Savage was any good at all, we'd have known more about it before everyone got to see how strong his arm was at pro days and combines and stuff. Exactly. He would have put up film like Teddy Bridgewater put up film. Yeah, right. If you're a quarterback who rises because of your pro day and your combine performance, but weren't on anyone's mind before that, then you're not very good at football. That's just all there is to it. <laughs> I mean, I, I had an undraftable grade based on his film. Oh, yeah, no question. And then I saw his arm, and I go, okay, cool, so I'm going to put him to a 255, which for me is a – Barely draftable, like right. Project. Great, got a cannon. Like awesome, he can throw it far. Right, that's your one redeemable trait to make you draftable. Jamarcus Russell threw it far too. <laughs> well, Shane Carden understands the game of football, but he makes a lot of stupid decisions on the field. So he's got that two fifty five grade. Mm-hmm. He's gotta make a hell of a quarterback coach one day. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No question. That's your boy, Matt. That is my boy. That that hurts me to see. Hurts me to hear it. I mean, it, Shane Shane did make some mistakes, and I agree with you. He he's a heady kid. He's a hard worker, but um, he's gonna have to he's gonna have to do a lot of work to uh to become anything resembling an NFL quarterback. And you're not gonna find a bigger fan of Shane than me. But unfortunately, that's the that's the truth. Yeah. What so, about so if as you guys look at what's that? I'm doing my best Shane Carden impression. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> as as you guys look at the board though, what this is tons of talk about this. 
Not what quarterback. Well, maybe both. What quarterback do you have ranked number three? And what quarterback do you think comes off the that is the third one to come off the board? Um, I have I have Hunley three right now, but even then that's a mid third round grade. Um, and I ha- if I had if I had to guess, I think I'd guess Bryce Petty, but I hate Bryce Petty. I have a seventh round grade on him because <laughs> I watched because. I'm a West Virginia fan, so I watched him against that West Virginia game, and I watched them get pressure on him, and he just chucked balls up like a fade route on like first and tens, like at their own 20 yard line. Right. It was bad. Yeah. He's That's the that whole Art Browse offense, though. It's chuck it deep, chuck it deep, chuck yeah. it deep. Yeah. And then yeah, yeah. Have track stars run down the field and go get the ball. Right. Um, I've got three different tiers that I always put draftable quarterbacks in. I've got guys who I think can be starters who always get first-round grades. If you can be a starter, you deserve a first-round grade. Mm -hmm. I've got guys who I think are career backup, Jason Garrett types, who I always give in that fourth to fifth-round grade range. And then I've got the expert clipboard holder, you know, needs a miracle to be a talented NFL quarterback range, which is seventh-round and later grade. So my tier one, I've only got three guys. I got Jameis, I got Marcus, and then I got Brett Hundley, who I've got a top 15 grade on. I really like Brett Hundley. I think he's the third quarterback off the board at number 10 to the St. Louis Rams. Oh, my. (laughs) Because, as I love to say, NFL teams do stupid shit. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, Hunley's my my third QB off the board as well. But if he went at ten, I, I don't know. I think the the arch might come down in St. Louis. <laughs> I would lose my mind if he went at ten. That would be insane. I think Petty's the yeah. third quarterback off the board, actually. But I have, I have Hunley third as well. Um, he is oh, there's traits there, but I'm not sure if they'll ever come out. Because he's just all over the place. I mean, that he has sometimes he has no pocket presence at all. He just runs, doesn't go through any progressions. Um, he can be as ina- inaccurate as hell. He, but then he can throw like the most, the prettiest ball. He's just all over the place. Tough to tough to refine him down to to a to a starter, I think. But you're high on him, Scott. Who Petty or Hunley? Yeah, no, Hundley. Hundley. I like Hunley because he's got all the tools. Right. He's got the athleticism. He's got the arm. He's a smart kid. But he needs someone to sit there and teach him how to play football. Yeah. And I think if you put him behind Nick Foles for a year, because Foles is nothing but a stopgap. Yeah. And then by, you know, game game say 26, or not 26, game 12 of the season, when Nick yeah. Foles throws his 30th interception of the year, and people go, what happened? He only threw two <laughs> a couple of years ago. And Chip Kelly! That, yeah, Chip Kelly was the reason why. Chip Kelly was the quarterback of that offense. He always will be the quarterback of that offense. But even Chip Kelly can't save Jim, or can't save Tim Tebow. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. Harsh. Um <laughs> Brett Hundley is the ideal quarterback for St. Louis. You just hope and pray that Jeff Fisher understands that an offense is needed to win games in the NFL. Mm -hmm. And the only quarterback that ever existed is not Steve McNair. (laughs) What's that saying about old dogs and new tricks? Yeah, that's that's what Fisher (laughs) and offense is. (laughs) I don't know how Frank Signetti got that offensive coordinator job. I'm just putting that out there. Mark Trustman was out there for the for the taking, and they gave it to some random schlub who has just always been one of Fisher's lackeys. Some guys are just only comfortable with certain people. They know aren't threatening to them. It's not how you win, but it's how some guys operate. Like Fisher just wants people who, are, like you said, are going to be like his lackeys, people he's always had, he's worked with before, you know. I mean, but even if you look at just guys that he's worked with, why not give Boudreaux 
the offensive coordinator spot. Yeah. At least they've got a good quarterback coach for once. Because mm -hmm. Chris Winky and his quarterback coaching school is more yeah, successful yeah. than George Whitfield's. Oh, yeah. He, he does know what he's doing. There's no question. I heard okay. terrific things about Chris Winky's uh, quarterback in school from your favorite guy there, Scott, from uh, Shane Carden. He was working with him this offseason. And... Just, I, I had a chance to, to, to talk with him once, and he's just, he's on the ball, and I think he was the perfect guy to get the job that he got, and I think he's he's going to be a rising star in the coaching world in the next couple of years, because he's, he's on the ball, he's he's even ahead of the game, he's a very smart guy, He's he was hardworking, and he continues to be hardworking, so I think that... You know, I think that if he was, if if Fetty ended up under under his tutelage, it, it could work out. And I think if you put Humley under his tutelage, I think it would be more than worth it. Right. A ten though. Oh, ten's rich. <laughs> yeah, too too rich for me to ten too. But ballsy though, I'll give you that. <laughs> if you're right, you're gonna win a lot of people, win a lot of mock draft competitions. <laughs> You know what would be amazing is if I hit, like, seven of the top eight picks, and then, like, the one that I don't hit is because it's tied early to the Jets. Is that what you have? No, I don't. I'm just saying it, that would be hilarious because I've been saying for the past, like, four months, living in Georgia and covering the Falcons, I hear so much about this Todd Gurley fellow. <laughs> and they're like, oh, yeah, he's going to go in the top ten. He's going to go in the top ten. I spent probably four days just doing research into this to make sure I wasn't wrong. In the entire history of the NFL draft, going back before the merger to, like, the 30s, based on what I could find, an NFL there has never been a running back go in the top 10 the year after tearing his ACL. Ever. Uh, really. Makes sense. Wow. Yeah. And there's Makes never been one in the top 15. And there's been one in the top 20. And there's been one in the top 25. But, but the one in the top 25 shredded every single ligament in his knee. Willis McGee. Right. That was a nasty yeah. one. Yeah, that was that was bad. I have Gurley going seventeen to the Chargers. I don't I don't think I've ever bought into the top ten talk. I have him at seventeen too. I have him at twenty seven at Dallas because I don't see any way he goes twenty five with as many people questioning his knee. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's like one of those, it only takes one scenario, but even Baltimore 25, I don't see them going there. Yeah, I got, I got him off the board. Yeah, it's it's I, think, I think it's the ideal fit for him. I think that a lot of teams are, are coming off the questions about his knee with some of the medical rechecks he's been doing. Uh, I, I think they're still concerned, but I don't think they're so concerned that they're going to pass on him. I just I see maybe two teams taking running backs in the first round, and one of them is the Chargers. And I just don't see the Chargers taking Gurley when they can get Gordon. Gordon has no injury issue. Gurley does. I, I just it doesn't make sense to me. Well, I think it, there could be a number of different reasons, but I think that one of them is that the Chargers feel like they have a decent stable of guys. If Gurley needs to miss time, and they also think that it's – I mean, if Gurley's ready, like, he's a, he's an animal. Like, talent-wise, I put him over Malvin Gordon, and I love Malvin Gordon. And not that Gordon's a bad fit at all. He would be too, but, you know, they like to use their backs as receivers. Gurley's a proven receiver. Um, and so I think that – I I get why they take Gurley, but it wouldn't surprise me at all to see them take Gordon either, to be honest. And, and that's perfectly fair. Mm. I, just, I think Gordon's an underrated receiver. Because when he was used as a receiver, yeah. he didn't look bad. 
I agree with that completely. Yeah, he he, he hardly was ever used that way. But yeah, I, I he doesn't he doesn't seem like it's something you'd struggle at at all. So, all right, guys, it looks like we've gone about an hour and ten minutes. <laughs> We don't really have an outline for the show. It looks like <laughs> if anyone, if anyone's still watching, let us know. Hashtag I'm still watching. <laughs> We've got like seven viewers. I mean, we're doing pretty good. Very nice. Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> um, but no, if anybody would like to contact any of us, you can find us on Twitter. Um, I've got my handle right here at Scott Karasik. Um, John Leg John is a J Ledyard PFS. J Ledge, J Ledge PFS. Yeah. Um. Anthony is Anthony Chado Chodo. <laughs> <laughs> and then Matthew is uh, Matt Lapan, right? Yeah, Matt underscore Lapan, L A P A N. So you can hit any of us up on Twitter. Um. You also read all of our stuff at Pro Football Spot. Um, that's kind of the whole point of the Hangout, to promote the site, have you guys read our stuff. We've all got final mock drafts up. Tell us how stupid we are because, well, that's what mock drafts are for. <laughs> the 25% hit rates for the good ones. So I'm Scott Karasik. It's been a fun show. Yes. <laughs>